Assalamu alaikum and good evening viewers. Today I am Masood Khan, your host. Uh, our, our episode today is on retail and manufacturing. So uh, I have in front of me Mr. KSM Minhas, the Managing Director of Unilever Consumer Care and of course my co-partner as well because I happen to be the chairman of this company. So today's topic is actually very important in the sense that, especially for Bangladesh, because these two sectors that I'm talking about has a great significance as far as Bangladesh is concerned. So we know that the manufacturing and retail sectors are critical for the economic growth as it employs a significant proportion of the country's labor force. We first start with the manufacturing sector that provides a transitional opportunity to the labor force in agriculture. In addition, the sector has a multiplier effect for job creation in the services sector. In general, every job created in the manufacturing sector creates two, three additional jobs in related activities. The ready-made garment sector in Bangladesh is a very good example of how manufacturing transformed an agrarian nation into an industrial one. This has led to development in the service industry as a backward linkage to manufacturing. In fact, the ready-made garments industry created new Bangladeshi entrepreneurs who flushed with their success, ventured into other capital intensive industries. If we look back at the amazing transformation of the sectoral contribution to GDP of Bangladesh, the change is striking. In the year 1971, just after liberation, agriculture was the largest contributor to GDP. 51%, followed by service sector 41% and industrial sector 8%, just a meager 8%. And now in the year 2020, service sector tops the list with being the highest contributor, which is about 51%, followed by industrial sector 36%, which was just 8% in 1971. And agriculture has dropped to 13%. And manufacturing, which is a subset of the industrial sector, accounts for 24% of GDP. The retailing sector, a subset of the services sector, has about BDT 3.6 trillion of GDP, wholesale plus retail. And this source is from Bangladesh Bureau of Statistics. This works out to around 14% of GDP, which is not a small number. Estimates of job creation in this sector ranges between 12 to 15% of the total workforce. So this is the backdrop of today's discussion. And as I said earlier, let us welcome Mr. Khan Salahuddin Mohammed Minhaj, Managing Director of Unilever Consumer Care, and of course, our guest for today's evening. A very warm, warm welcome to you, Minhaj. Thank you, Masood Bhai. Uh, extremely delighted to be here. Uh, looking forward to a great discussion. I'm looking forward as well, of course, because I know that you're going to give a lot of insights to, to the us and to the viewers as well. So without further ado, we, let's go to my first question. And that is that you have become the managing director of a very reputed multinational company at a very, very early age. Tell us something about yourself, your journey, your vision and aspirations during your formative years and your achievements that has brought you to this vaunted position. What do you mean, Hans? Thank you. Uh, uh, thanks for asking the question. Uh, I'm, I'm just thinking where to start from. I'll just go back to my academic year first and then I'll talk about the professional part. Um, I was uh, been born and brought up in Dhaka. 
I went to a school called Saint Joseph High School, and from there went to Dhaka College, and uh, then later on did my uh, business graduation in Dhaka University in Faculty of Business Studies, and later on did my MBA as well in Dhaka University in IBA. So I started my job uh, in in 2000 um, in supply chain in Nestle. Um, so uh, long time back, about 21 years back. Um, and then worked there in supply chain for about a year, then moved to marketing, uh, worked in marketing in brand management. And in 2006, I moved to uh, Unilever as a senior brand manager in, uh, in, in laundry category. Over there, I've worked in uh, home care and uh, beauty and personal care categories before uh, moving into uh, the management committee in 2011. That's about a uh, little bit over 10 years from now. Uh, worked as the marketing director for about three years and then I was given the opportunity to change length to have a more broader uh, go-to-market exposure and I moved into sales as the sales director worked there for about six years and and you know when uh, when uh, Unilever acquired the nutrition portfolio of GSK in Bangladesh and that is when the board of course led by you appointed me as the CEO um, of Unilever Consumer Care Limited, uh, which is a new name now. Uh, so that's a, a short uh, background. Uh, if you ask me aspiration or uh, you know how how I made it, uh, honestly, uh, about 21 years back, if somebody had asked me that this is where you will be in 21 years from now, I would have taken it with both hands. But I did not plan for it. Uh, I have always kept, you know, both my eyes focused on my work. Uh, as it is said that if you keep one eye on the destination and one eye on your work, then probably you will not be able to work with full productivity. If you keep both your eyes on the work, then probably you will be able to give your best and stay focused. So that is what I did. Um, and and uh, one step at a time, every role I played, I tried, tried to make sure that you know, I work with my team very closely, inspire them, motivate them to bring their best out of that. And, and uh, you know, and career is taken care of automatically, uh, if you ask me. Um, I have been able to show the right resilience, uh, as they say. Success is, you know, how high you jump when you hit the low. And I've hit low uh, many times in my life, both on the professional front and on the personal front as well. But uh, Alhamdulillah, was able to jump out of it uh, and 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 probably that is what made the difference um, professional achievements i think i was i was uh, quite lucky to be part of quite a few journey uh, in unilever especially you know the time when we moved um, the upgradation journey in the laundry portfolio it was a completely mass uh, wheel driven portfolio and we have upgraded that into wheel now we have a sizable mid-tier business and that premiumization helped us grow as well. Similar journey we have taken in uh, beauty, in shampoo and in face care. Introduced brands like Vaseline, um, Purit, which has become a sizable business. And uh, over the last year, one year, we have been doing quite well on the, on the UCL front as well. Uh, the business somehow, somewhat was struggling. Uh, for eight quarters, we got back in growth this year first quarter and uh, the the first two quarter has been strong double digit growth uh, keeping our fingers crossed for the rest of the year so uh, so that's basically it uh, from my end vision as of now is how do we work very closely to er eradicate nutrition as much as possible uh, malnutrition as much as possible in the country and how do we grow this business how do we double this business for example in in next five years it's a low penetrate business and a huge opportunity so uh, so that's that's what i'm looking forward to thank you so much Minhas. i think <clears throat> fascinating journey i would say and uh, a pure pedigree i would say in fact because just you fight iba <clears throat> and your job in nestle and then in Unilever, I, do, I don't think Unilever could have chosen a better person as you as for the managing director's position thank you so much so i go on to the next question which i'm sure the viewers will be very interested also we are now in the fourth industrial revolution and technology rules the world and indeed the corporates. How has this impacted the FMCG industry in general 
and your company, or rather our company in particular. What steps have you taken to use technology as an enabler? Yeah, thanks for the question. You're absolutely right, Masud Bhai. Uh, as we say nowadays, that data is the new currency. And uh, you know, technology is the backbone uh, that, that forms the competitive advantage and uh, you know in the, in the short term mid term and maybe in the long term as well and uh, and fmcg is no exception to that um, from unilever's perspective our our philosophy is very simple uh, on this um, we would like to stay ahead of the curve we would rather disrupt than being disrupted on this front and we have been working with the right investment with the right strategy on the technology front end to end uh, for quite some time back, uh, for, for quite some time now. Um, and and uh, to get a little bit into the detail uh, of this is the way we are structuring our strategies, what role technology, data, uh, data-driven decision-making, algorithm, AI can play in the way we generate demand, in the way we capture demand, in the way we fulfill demand. Again, I'll give you some of the examples of some of the work that we do. For example, you know, if I talk about how do we generate demand and what role technology plays into that, okay? And and in fact, in the board meeting, you have asked me quite a bit of time that you know, uh, in as how much money are you spending in traditional media versus in digital media? Because consumers are shifting towards digital media, and we have to chase the consumers on that front as well, right? So we are accordingly doing a balance in terms of spending between uh, traditional and digital media to make sure that you know we stay ahead of the curve on this front second is um, throughout years we have done a lot of activation on ground activation unilever in bangladesh is known for its executional excellence it's an execution powerhouse when it comes to activation and through that over time what we have done is we have captured a lot of data uh, for example, millions of uh, memos from outlets that came to us. And most of these memos are handwritten memos, right? And, uh, and what we are doing is we are using technology to convert handwritten data into structured digital data, which can then be used to analyze shopper basket for consumer remarketing, okay? And as you know, with machine learning, the more input you get give the more accurate will be the data and we have reached a stage where we can start using this data now for example if we analyze a shopper offtake data and see that in the shopper basket a surf excel is there and the uh, dove is shampoo is also there you will automatically assume that it's a premium consumer can we remarket with another premium brand that the consumer is not or the shopper is not purchasing at this moment so those are the technologies we're applying on the generating demand front. Now, same, if you go one step back, you know, how do we capture data also becomes important. You'll be happy to know, in fact, you know that very well, that 100% of our orders that comes through our sales reps are captured in handheld terminals, the HHTs, okay? And that is linked back with our system so that we can see real-time orders that's coming in, which allows us to make any change in the back end if we see a sudden spike or if we see some sort of skews in the order and this is something that has really helped us during the covid period where we have seen that that the consumer behavior changed and as a result of that there was a shift in demand towards more hygiene driven products or towards more poor excuse i think that is something that we have seen now another example is we have introduced a retailer's android based app through which a retailer can order our product 24-7 uh, without the need of a physical presence of a sales rep. Okay, And data is flowing through that as well. Now, we have already reached about more than 150,000 outlets with that app, and which is a sizable number. And in line with the, with the smartphone penetration that's there uh, at the retail end. So going forward, what we can use is that the same app, the same technology can be used to, to use that app as a wallet, where all the payout that goes from our end to trade can be given in the wallet, which can again be circulated through order and come back to us. 
okay that will unlock if you want to do uh, you know going forward if you want, want to introduce financial solution or bring in financial inclusion provide credit to the retailers that app can play a big role the data that gets generated through that app can be analyzed for understanding for working out cohorts of retailers and doing uh, marketing among the retailers as well so it, it unlocks a lot of opportunity at the back end automation is helping us depot replenishment distributor replenishment as well we are working on rpa a robotic process automation which will help us you know move a lot of non value added repetitive tasks to automation so that people can focus on more value added work so if you look into it there is an end to end solution that we are working on uh, not any particular wing of the organization and that will give us the competitive edge going forward whoever focuses on that invest in this area probably will stay a step ahead of the market is what my view is and unless i'm mistaken i think most of this uh, let's say world class fmcg companies in bangladesh i think also are following a similar route if i'm not mistaken yes yes um the the retailer app probably uh, as of now has not evolved in other areas but uh, in the, in the other cases yes everybody everybody is waking up to the call and know that absolutely. technology there is no second option to invest in absolutely absolutely because rpa ai and blockchain i think ia blockchain everything is now taking over our lives basically in a way actually fact okay so uh, going on to the next question because i think uh, especially with your background in nestle Uh, so we know that before the pandemic hit us the concept of supply chain was around but did not get the due importance the pandemic has brought into the limelight that a robust supply chain matters what lessons have the fmg fmc industry and you have learned and what are your thoughts going forward yeah i think uh, a fantastic question uh, masood bhai um if you ask me historically supply chain operations used to be known for low cost lean high efficiency model okay but but pandemic did teach us or gave us a different lesson okay it told us the importance of uh, working and engaging very closely with your vendor partners understanding their constraint but they will signal you you know any opportunity or any hiccup or any trouble that is coming up in the in the near term uh, if you ask me uh, in in fact our vendors help us they gave us signal uh, very early that we need to you know look into our supply chain because there there can be a disruption that's going to come in uh, i i think that is one thing um the other thing is something that we have never thought about is do we plan for redundancy in supply chain okay uh, as you know um, if i if i specifically take ucl for an example uh, we have something called a dry mix ingredient which constitutes to about 65 70% of the uh, raw material that we have and due to global supply chain issue during the pandemic we suffered on that front as well right had there been a redundancy plan ahead of time you know we could have avoided uh, that problem in fact in the second wave you know we have planned for increasing our inventory to 90 days just to make sure that if there is an interruption in the global supply chain and we are safeguarded for a certain period of time and by that time probably this problem will get solved i think that that redundancy itself should be built into the plan uh, going forward now the other thing is um, pandemic has also taught us that consumer behaviors can change overnight you know the pandemic uh, overnight accelerated the digital digital adoption of the consumers of shoppers and trade as well now as i've said in the previous question those organization who have been investing behind technology probably did not get the brunt out of it but those who were falling behind probably suffered more we had our own platform in u shop uh, where we can actually collect consumer order online we use that the app that i have talked about during the pandemic where we were into lockdown and physically collecting order was a challenge 
retailers came up and ordered in a huge amount through the app that actually helped us so i think that is another big lesson that we have the other thing is importance of predictability the the accuracy with which you capture data will reflect in the accuracy of your forecast as well which will safeguard you in difficult times like a pandemic and an important part is how do you balance between fixed cost and variable cost your fixed investment and the other cost for example you know most of the organization like having backward integration right with their own investment you invest in a huge fleet okay which becomes a fixed cost and if during pandemic you are sitting on no sales for a certain period that cost will come and hit you right so how do you look into the cost and move most of your cost in variable in nature that will safeguard you in difficult times is also another area that we need to consider going forward i think those are the more or less areas where we should yeah take lesson from during the pandemic and and probably we'll see an input uh you know and in 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 supply chain coming I mean, and uh, how do you see as far as the you know the of other F- fmcg companies are concerned let's say locals or mncs in terms of their response in terms of their thoughts going forward actually in fact so my my personal observation is um, i i've seen in the first wave um, uh, the way we operated i did not see too many organization operating in the same way hmm. uh, you know in the first wave but by the time the second wave came in i think all took their own learning and and you know we are very smart we see what others are doing in the industry we take those learnings right. and that's absolutely fine right. uh, because right. at the end of the day it helps the economy uh, if all can flourish together so I, i think they've taken the learning and and and, and uh, use those learning uh, in the second wave um, that's that's what i have observed Yeah, 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 you're absolutely correct, you know. So I fully agree with you. Okay, so going on to the next question, my next question, in fact, and this is a very important question, as far as I'm concerned, because we know that world-class companies are defined by the quality of people and innovation. I use two words here actually. What are your thoughts on this issue, and how are you investing in your people to harness their full potential? okay a question very close to my heart as well uh master bhai i think we all know and in, in fact it's common for most of the all the organization i would say that people are your most important asset right and um, and and people also are the main source of competitive edge uh, for us that is how we see um we want to be a purpose led future fit organization Uh, and our people agenda should center around that as well mm-hmm. okay and right. that thinking goes into all the aspects of people starting from how we recruit people how right. do we develop them how we retain them as well okay so if i talk about unilever uh, you know the way we recruit we are very clear in my in our mind that when we recruit people we recruit for their attitude for their mindset for their values those are the checks that we tick at the recruitment stage we have a standard a set of standard uh, of leadership behaviors that we expect from people we check those not necessarily we are too much focused on competency at that stage unless and until it's a specialized role where we are looking for a mid career recruit you know it's more about the values it's more about their thinking their mindset their positive approach uh, those are the things that we look for okay because we are sure that we have an internal system that will build competency automatically if we have the right people in place then is how do you form a team what kind of team we want to form okay and that is where diversity and inclusion comes into play uh, in our organization Uh, we strongly believe in diversity and there is a strong consumer reason to it as well or a business reason to it as well now if you look into our consumers or the users of our product you will see most of them would be female there are youth there are young men and women um, 
people from different religion people from different background are the users or the consumers of our product now we need to ensure the same representation of the society the same representation of the consumer pool into our team as well that makes a diverse team and it is proven again and again a diverse team is much stronger brings out better innovation because there is a diverse of thinking diversity of thinking as well and the productivity is also higher and when we talk about diversity it is all, not only gender diversity that we talk about it is diversity of religion it is diversity of educational background it is transgender diversity everything comes into play when we create a team okay and that is what uh, we have been focusing on the second part is inclusion uh, where we just to make sure we want to make sure that everybody is not only treated equally but treated the way they deserve to be treated i think that is where a difference between equality and equity comes in we want to make sure that each and every member of our team they have a point of view and they know that their voice is heard in the organization once you can create an environment for similar to this you will see productivity will automatically come in and people will flourish we strongly believe as we said we want to be a purpose led future fit organization we strongly believe that people with purpose thrive and we actively work out workshop in the organization to help people realize or identify their purpose and we support them to live by their purpose okay and that is how people actually flourish if we can do that so 100% of our employees actually have gone through a purpose workshop and they have a purpose uh, behind them my purpose for example is to create a legacy of togetherness and optimism which came out through a workshop only uh, that i did okay. and 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 if you ask me uh, once all these fundamentals are in place competency is what we focus on and we have both a on the job model a classroom model and an online model of building competency of our people we have a very rich uh, content or module of online courses where all of our employees have access to uh, we are also uh, partnered or collaborated with linkedin as well to get a lot of learning modules which also help us so all put together actually creates a team and historically we have uh, we take a lot of pride from saying that a lot of unilever talent has moved up to become a ceo not only for unilever but also for other uh, uh, organizations uh, in the industry as well so so we we take a lot of pride from our alumni as well great actually in fact i think uh, is i think precisely for this reason that unilever actually has been consistently rated as one of the most preferred employers am i right on this issue yeah. yes it just shows on what you have just said just now actually in fact thank you so much milhas okay viewers so we now take a short break and we will just be back after the break just uh, just bear with us very good evening before we move into the second half of this episode of expert eye we would like to bring you a short message from our sponsors now this this uh, this episode is being sponsored by prime bank limited as well as a plethora of other brands including mastercard bangladesh city capital investment limited adian technologies dr bhai my classroom online as well as many other brands like ab bank Now ladies and gentlemen it is because of these brands that Valor of Bangladesh continuously remains empowered and is able to come up with a host of different events like this one and therefore we would like to take a moment and acknowledge their empowerment and their continuous assistance in this regard thank you okay thank you very much so we move on in that case So my next question to you Minhas is a big one actually in fact so you got to give some time on this one so in your opinion what challenges are the fmcg industry currently facing be it market competition 
regulatory, fiscal, monetary. Also discuss this issue in the context of our company and the fiscal, regulatory or any other support needed. Yeah, I think I'll, I'll start off with competition. Uh, competition is good, uh, good for the business because, uh, you know, a healthy competition means that the market actually grows faster. Uh, that is what we have seen in the past as well. Uh, it makes us, it makes everybody more responsible, put responsible, put pressure on all the players in the industry, pressure on them to make sure that you provide product that is of highest quality and give the consumers the right value uh, for it. Okay. Uh, while, while that is true, it is important. And, and that is where, you know, our um, observation is that it is important to create a level playing field uh, which we are not sure whether often exists or not okay uh, being a multinational uh, we are highly driven by our values uh, respect for the law of the country 100% uh, compliance is a non-negotiable and a fundamental for us okay but if the same level playing field is not created and everybody is not governed by the same mechanism or you know we find ourselves under a lot of pressure i think um, i won't say who I, I won't comment about others but it is important to have that level playing playing field otherwise you know um, you will end up with having a pressure on that front especially from the cost aspect as well i think that is one area um the regulatory environment in the country is uh, is, is is quite uh, friendly quite okay um i i must say however uh, some unpredictability of regulation uh, might hinder you uh, in terms of your planning for the long term mm -hmm. so consistency is needed um, and if you ask me the government needs to look into how we can further ensure ease of doing business in this country so that we can attract more foreign investors uh, in the country uh, going forward um, on on the fiscal and monetary front if you ask me um, the government has got strong ambition in terms of collecting revenue which is the right thing to do for our economy like we have over here uh, but it is important that the tax burden is not skewed towards the compliant organization rather the tax net should be more broad based equally distributed which will help the government for collecting better as well and and that is how if you see the more comparable countries also play okay i think if you if you don't do that then you keep up putting burden on certain group of organization that becomes a big problem because what we don't want to do is you know, forward this pressure to our consumers. Our consumers should not suffer because of it. Same applies to the duties. Okay. Uh, if you look into the duties on raw materials, you know the kind of duties uh, we pay for for uh, the key raw material uh, for Horlicks, for example. Okay. And and we are very determined that we will be extremely sensitive to our price. Uh, in fact, a couple of years back, less than a couple of years, we have actually reduced price or corrected price. We are looking into introducing more LUPs so that we can give more value to our consumers. In a business where there is a low penetration and the country where malnutrition is an area to address, you want to give the best value to the consumer. But your duty structure should support that as well. You know, we don't want to be pricing ourselves 30 to 40 percent premium for the same product in our neighboring countries which is the case at this moment you know if you end up in a situation like that you will see cross border uh infected cross border products will start flowing in you will end up seeing a lot of gray products in the market uh, and and that creates a chaos for doing business for us i think that is one area uh, we do keep highlighting our concern to the government, of course, um, on these areas. But but of course, duty is one area where we need to look into so that we stay comparable for the same products in the in the 
uh, neighboring countries. So uh, that's that's basically my view uh, on this front. I think I couldn't agree with you more. In fact, uh, today in the newspaper, I was just reading an article on the tire industry, uh, the problems they are facing, which is a similar one that they have. Most of them have not started production now. They've stopped production because the duty rates on raw materials are so high; it's around twenty-five percent, whereas the imported tires are coming at ten percent duty. So obviously, this is not a level playing field. And if you want to encourage local manufacturing, in that case, you have got to make sure that this is rationalized. And I agree with you that this issue could be an issue in the future if this thing continues, because we have seen in the past also parallel imports coming in for Holdix when the pricing was not right. Actually, in fact, because of the duties and the duties being so high as twenty-five percent, which is not right for a raw material. I think this is an issue that I think we need to keep. Hammering to our regulators that we can't just do business in this manner unless it's a level playing field. Actually, in fact, thank you absolutely. so much, Nihas, for being. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, so going on to the next question, and this is also a very important one because you are you are a pedigree as far as the FMCG industry is concerned. So you have been in the FMCG company for industry for many years. So what are the changes? That you're seeing over the years, and what changes do you foresee in the next ten years? Okay, so forcing changes is very difficult <laughs> to predict, uh, and and there are many times I've seen the experts give an opinion, and which uh, you know reality goes into an opposite direction. However, I'll still try to make an attempt into uh, into this, and I'll start off with what are the changes, yeah. Yeah. What are the changes the, the I've seen. Uh, in Correct. the past, where I'm going to start exactly. off. Yeah. yeah. So, if you ask me, historically, uh, FMCG business in, in especially the the categories that Unilever operates in, uh, because my knowledge is more centered in that area, uh, has been driven by simple market development model. Okay, riding on traditional media, uh, taking the advantage of captive audience in TV, for example. Okay, so when you have a captive audience, you can communicate, you can tell a story. You don't need to make things fragmented or complex. It is very easy to communicate. So a very basic model was ride on traditional media, get the right product in, get the right story in, give the best value to the consumers, which is consistent, which is now and then as well, uh, and then start driving market development. All right. On top of the traditional media, go for on-ground activation to educate the consumers about our product. Okay, that is how we built a laundry business. We converted consumers who used to use their elbow strength uh, with a laundry bar to wash their clothes. We converted them into NSD with wheel washing powder over time. Okay, uh, we have. Taught people how to use a shampoo to wash their hair over time. Okay, that market building also happened. A penetration which was very low, below ten percent, has now moved into more than eighty percent. Um, with with the market development tasks that we have done uh, over over the past. Okay, and that model was very simple. The distribution model was also very simple. Existing brick and mortar trade. Uh, structure was there. Have distributors get the vehicles in, get the people in. Absolute manual operation. Keep it simple, and keep fulfilling at the trade end. Okay, that is what has worked. But now, if you move from there to now and forward as well, things are no more that simple. It's much more complex. Starting from how fragmented the consumer need has become. Okay. Just to give you an example, and I'll, I'll, I'll sorry, I'll take a bit of time on this one. Uh, yeah, yeah, do. It's very important. Actually. Earlier, earlier, a consumer used to use a soap bar during bathing, and the same soap bar was used in hand oh. and body. The same on your face, and the same on washing your hair as well. Correct. Okay. Correct. Now. That consumer need has got fragmented. Now you use a soap bar only on your hand and body. You use a face wash on your face. 
you use yes. a shampoo on your hair on top of that you use a conditioner as well right and then right. for your hand you have a hand wash liquid hand wash which is another need and from hand wash liquid to keep your hands safe you have now moved into hand sanitizer as well okay now from one need of a soap bar think how the need got fragmented into so many areas okay what it means for us as an fmcg player is proliferation of sqs as well okay yes. your business has become more complex that has if you go to the back end what it means for supply chain is managing complexity yes all right so a fragmentation is a big change that we see and probably it's going to go even further from a simple facial moisturizer we have now moved into a lip care an eye care a day cream a night cream so again a lot of fragmentation over there okay and this is something that's going to increase and for all the organization along with this they will have to develop the capability to manage complexities okay so that is one thing. second change that i have seen is the traditional media and the simple captive audience they don't exist anymore okay with the as internet evolved okay uh, penetration of smartphone are going up consumers are becoming more empowered more empowered more demanding as well they are like always on 24/7 all right and you have to chase down your consumers you don't have a captive audience anymore okay you have to break down your consumers into cohorts customize your communication for each of the consumers or each of the cohort to actually stay ahead of the curve on this journey i think that is another big change uh that we are seeing uh coming up uh next is if you look break down the country okay uh, what we call is an lsm profile lifestyle measure what we have seen mm -hmm. over the last decade is there is a big app affluent group as the consumers moved up the lap lifestyle measures so people have become more affluent a big chunk or a or a portion contributes a big part of the economy while at the same time you see a big bottom of the pyramid still saying there okay now that means we now have two halves Absolutely. of the same country okay now again another complexity is the two halves they have different needs how do you work out your portfolio to cater to the needs of the have lots and the have nots both at the same time so again a yes. proliferation is needed one probably will require more lups more value conscious the others probably uh, will go for a larger pack or a premium product your communication to the to these different group will also have to be different so i think that is another one uh, that that i want to and and consumers as i said consumers will put pressure on you because advocacy nowadays plays a big role okay consumers will not buy into what you are communicating they will look into in that product how many likes are there what others are commenting on that product and based on that they will form an opinion so you have to win on advocacy as well to win with the consumer so that is the other part the last part that i would like to talk about is you know when all these things changing going forward the psyche of the young generation of your and your employees will also change gone are the days where you will have employees who will enter into your organization and stay in the organization for their lifetime no stickability will come down yes and that is where how do you make sure that they leave their purpose how do you keep yourself keep your organization attractive to them diversity and inclusion that i talked about becomes extremely important there will be more specialized resource requirement data science technology experts will be needed and maybe all will not be sitting in your organization as permanent employees you have to find out them you have to bring in agile working environment flexible working environment everything needs to be brought into your policy itself to make sure that you are in line 
with the resourcing requirement that you have for the organization. I think going forward, those are the changes uh, that you will see coming in. Data, technology, analytics, algo expertise, data-driven decision-making, machine learning, AI will make a big difference. And all this, the outcome would be, of course, a lot of complexities that you have to manage, building capability to unlearn, learn, relearn, will become extremely, extremely important going forward in my view. Absolutely correct me, Haz. I think, you know, uh, I was in the board of Marico. I just retired last year from there. And one one thing they, were, they told me that, sir, actually six years back, we just had one parachute oil because people wanted a hair oil. But now they want 10 different types of hair oil, actually, in fact. So this is the change that we're seeing. And I think in future, this is going to get much more, actually, in fact. Anyway, thank you very much. So I think uh, as far as the discussions are concerned, we are over now. But now we've got a number of questions being asked by the by the audience. So uh, first question is that, what is the current scenario of retail industry in Bangladesh? You want to say, share something or you want me to add to, on this one? Uh, you can add and you can start. I can also add whichever way you want. So you start and I'll just supplement something. Okay. The scenario, what is the scenario of retail industry in Bangladesh? It's, it's, it's a very broad question, I must say. Yeah. yeah. Uh, if you ask, uh, you know, the retail sensor shows that, um, you know, there are about 1.7 uh, million universe uh, that we have, uh, very fragmented. Major chunk of it is uh, neighborhood grocers, as we call it. Uh, there's a big chunk uh, that is the wet market grocers. Uh, modern trade still quite small, uh, very urban centric, but contribution wise is very small. And then the old wholesale model is still there uh, that exists. But numerically, mm -hmm. I think uh, neighborhood grocers or the mom and pop shops, as we call it, are the, are the largest one. Uh, Bangladesh is quite unique in the sense that probably per square feet basis, this would be the country with the highest concentration of retail outlets if you if you look into south asia okay yes, yes. Uh, some of yes. these are evolving as well uh, with the with the advent of ecom uh, retailers are also looking into how do they win in this new model some retailers are thinking of hybrid model where they will have a physical store but at the same time an online leg to it uh, as well, uh, how we can serve door to door uh, at the convenience or convenience of the consumers are also being thought up, thought out. A basic difference between Bangladesh and other countries is where modern trade is, because most of the other relatively developed countries, modern trade actually plays a strong contribution. That's because value seekers goes into those uh, outlets. In in Bangladesh, probably because of the high cost of real estate and 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 the struggle in getting a parking facility you will see mm -hmm. modern trade actually struggles to match the value of a wet market and the value seekers end up going to the wet market then the modern trade uh, unlike other countries i think this is one one challenge that will continue to be in fact need wise they both serve the same purpose apart if you take out the pleasure shopping uh, from the equation you will see in the wet market also under the same roof you will get a vegetable corner, you will get groceries, uh, uh, confectionaries, everything is available like a modern trade. So for the value seekers, it makes sense. Mm -hmm. I think, I think I, I don't know, that's that's a kind of overview that I can, I can give you on the retail uh, front, especially for FMCG, if you ask me. Yeah, I think uh, one more point I'd like to add is the fact that, you know, uh, because let's say as far as the moments uh, pop stores are concerned, they are still ruling Bangladesh, actually, in fact. And uh, if I look at the super stores, which came up in 2001 with Agora, I think they're still struggling in the sense that because there's no level playing field, they are paying VAT, whereas the uh, moment pop stores, they don't pay VAT, actually, in fact. Absolutely. And now, of and course, this, is, this is a big challenge for them. And the second part is that as far as e-commerce is concerned, which, which is picking up, actually, although it is very niche still, I would say, in the urban areas, but I think this recent events again will just push this issue back a bit actually in fact. 
So challenges ahead, I think, as far as the detail front is concerned, as far as e-commerce e is concerned, and I think for the the for the for the big stores actually, in fact. Okay, so uh, the there's one question which has come up here is that what can the tax compliant companies do to get the government to enforce a level playing field? Masood bhai, with your background and with your knowledge, <laughs> I think you're far, <laughs> far, far better in your position to answer this one. Okay, fair. I think the answer is very simple actually, in fact, because the first thing is that, I mean, we know that, let's say, even, even if I'm talking about, um, uh, let's say, tax compliant companies and the people who file taxes, the numbers are far small. In fact, there's a number which says that around 2.5 million uh, returns are submitted, whereas the potential is about 4 crores actually, in fact. So I think it's very important in the sense that if the government starts looking at, into those persons who are really not paying taxes, in that case, the tax burden will come down on the compliant companies as well. So there, you know, all their focus should be towards making sure that ultimately uh, this is done actually, in fact. And in today's world, to do this is not very difficult with, with digitization, actually, in fact. If the government really starts collecting the data, in that case, I think uh, they can do a lot in terms of trying to make sure that the non-compliant companies actually are uh, brought into the dragnet, actually, in fact. So I think uh, that's my take on this subject. Not an easy one, but I think we need to do something on this score because uh, if I look at the tax to the GDP in Bangladesh, it is around 14%, which is one of the lowest in the world, actually, in fact. Uh, in, if, if I go to Vietnam, it is more than 50%, actually, in fact, our, our nearest competitor, actually, in fact. So a lot needs to be done in this area for sure, absolutely. Uh, one more question I can see on the screen is this, that is it really necessary to invest in transformation after the impacts on our economy due to Corona? I would, I would say that it is not necessary. It's mandatory, irrespective yeah, of it. The trend that I've talked about, the fragmentation of consumer need that I've talked about, the changing behavior of the consumers that we have talked about demands a change uh, if you want to have a competitive age in this industry. You know, Absolutely. what we do is we chase down our consumers. We don't decide. Our consumers decide for us. If you look into the penetration of Internet in this country, if you look into the rate with which digital adoption is happening, Bangladesh is probably, Dhaka is uh, the second largest Facebook user city uh, probably uh, uh, in the world. And that tells you that how fast digital adoption is happening in the youth centric country that we have. So it's not a matter of choice for us. Um, Corona probably just accelerated it further, yeah, but the requirement was always there. We did not start, for example, investing in technology and digitization after the Corona hit us. We started it way ahead of us. Yes, Corona yes, only yes. accelerated uh, the transformation. Yes, yes, absolutely. You're quite right, actually, in fact, because, you know, um, it's like somebody saying that, you know, I'm making a loss, so should I invest in uh, advertising and promotion, actually, in fact? This is the best time to invest, actually, in fact, because maybe you're making a loss because you've not invested enough, actually, in fact. And digitization is something which is a big, big, big enabler as far as the, you know, the companies are concerned, actually, in fact. We know that, actually, in fact. And that is the cutting edge as far as companies are concerned, I think, really. So I think that's 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 an important discussion, I think, as far as, as we are concerned. So... Uh, Again, uh, let's say, going back to the issue of, uh, uh, I think there was another question that what is the impact of digitization on retailing and uh, and and manufacturing? There was a question on that, actually. So I think you've answered a lot, but still you might like to add a bit more on this point, actually. Yeah. I, I think, yeah. Yeah, I think uh, a big impact that comes out of digitization is your predictability, the accuracy of your predictability. Okay, and and as I've said that, you know, when hundred percent of our orders are getting captured through a device which is backlinked to our system, you get to see orders real time. Based on today's order, you can actually start manufacturing and deliver tomorrow. Okay, that is how fast you can do it. You can maintain a lean supply chain while at the same time the flexibility of getting a skewness or a spike the signals earlier than others right 
automation will also ensure that a lot of non value added task that is occupying your manual man hour okay can be moved to machine or robots yes. and yes. your yeah. people where creative thinking is needed can focus on the right value added job i think that is a there is a big big area uh, where value addition comes in if you can automate end to end not as i said it has to be end to end not in a particular wing of the organization you are absolutely correct i think uh, this is the way forward and uh, and uh, you mentioned about a robotic process or automation i think this is something that is going that is happening very very quickly as a matter of fact and you know i was just speaking to somebody the other day and he was saying that let's say in erp for example let's say you know we what we do is that we get an invoice we enter the invoice the supplies code and we enter the expense code but no longer actually because now you can have robotic automation where the robot scans the invoice he knows the particular fields and he makes the entry in the screen and that is that's it you don't require a human interface actually in fact so all these repetitive jobs that you're talking about i mean all the repetitive jobs day in and day out that you do i think uh, ultimately is going to get very quickly taken over by robots i think that's going to happen very 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 quickly and let's make no mistake about that and i think that's a that's a that's a worrying sign i'm sure for a lot of people but there comes the question of reskilling actually in fact because a lot of people who don't really see this writing on the wall actually in fact i think they will be caught napping actually in fact so they should start reskilling now that the future is there actually in fact and the future is already knocking at the door i know of companies in bangladesh now who are actually offering robotic process automation solutions actually in fact so i think uh, you know this is a very important area so i think uh, i mean, we are, i think we are almost at the end of our discussions today uh, we, we don't have much time to finish now so i think if i may just wrap up the discussions that we had today uh, first of all we can see enormous changes that is happening in the fmcg arena in terms of customer behaviors and in terms of making sure that we understand the needs and that is getting much much more complex because they are getting very very discerning actually in fact and there comes the question of using the digital infrastructure to make sure that we get all the data and the question of big data is now coming in actually in fact because we are getting data from every point actually in fact from the point of sale from the retail point from the from the suppliers from the from the customers at all point for the retail points we are getting data so we have to make sure that this data is really captured by us and make sure that we can use it for for a, for for a, for making informed decisions i think this is my take on the subject and as we discuss that at the end of the day it's very important that we have a level playing field because we have got a lot of compliant companies in bangladesh and not so compliant and for the future for the compliant companies to survive we have to make sure that the ease of doing business improves and of course it things become easier as far as the regulations are, for as far as the fiscal measures are concerned so that we don't have situations where we have got some parallel imports coming in for example and competition coming in so i think of this viewers thank you very much for being with us this evening i'm sure you enjoyed the show and again i would like to thank a lot minhas who is in front of me for his very very valuable speech minhas thank you so much for your great deliberations i'm sure the audience has been fascinated and learned a lot from this actually thank you so much minhas it, it was my pleasure masood bhai and thanks once again for inviting me really enjoyed it thank you very much and good evening and assalamu alaikum to everybody allah hafiz thank you